those butter pecan cookies sound good. I might try to make them. have a prayer and then we'll begin our study. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to study your word. And Father, as we're looking at this, your book of Revelation, we ask you, Father, to please help us to, to see your, your word for what it's saying. This is a very uh, oftentimes misunderstood book, Father. Help us to see your word for what you meant it to be to recognize, Father, your truth, and to uh, be willing and able to share it with other people. Uh, getting people's interest into your word is always an important thing, Father. Help us to, to do so in such a way that not only are they interested, but they learn your truth and not things that we want your word to say. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Okay, we're going to be starting Revelation chapter 5, if you want to open up your Bibles, please. Revelation chapter 5. Last 
week, we went through chapter four, and it's like I told you all, when we get into chapter four, when we start with the chapter four of Revelation, from there, we start going at a much faster pace. And we finished chapter four last week. Um, I, um, it worked out since we didn't have singing like we sometimes do on Wednesday nights, and we may keep it that way for a while. Just go ahead and start right into our Bible class on Wednesday nights. So uh, we, we, looked at, we looked last week and noted that John began his vision. He was called up into heaven, the throne room of God, there in verse 1. And he sees God sitting on his throne. And he also sees four living creatures. And when we looked at what, who those four living creatures seemed to be, by description and looking in the Old Testament at a similar description, we believe those are the seraphim. Not the uh, not angels, not 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 uh, uh, cherubim. <laughs> what am I trying? I can't even say my words. Cherubim. cherubim. Thank you. I kept I was leaving the H out. Uh, not cherubim. Like well, you see at the edge of the garden, but seraphim. And that is just by the description of the of the number of wings and the, also the faces that they had, and uh, and then we saw the twenty four elders. Now, those 24 elders, as we mentioned, seem to be showing both sides of the cross, both, both covenants, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, New Covenant. And remember, there was 12 apostles, and there was 12 tribes. And so we're, that number 12 is the number of religion. And so it seems that last week when we looked at Revelation chapter 4, we were seeing that God... And, and the, the, well, I'm sorry, the seraphim, the living creatures, and the elders were recognizing God and glorifying God. Now in chapter 5, we are going to see Jesus Christ come upon the scene. And uh, he's going to be described as the lamb that was slain. So let's read through these, uh, all of chapter 5, and then we're going to go back and look and see each one of these, uh, each, each one of these verses. I, <coughs> Let me start with a, with a thing of drink of water. Excuse me. Okay, verse one of chapter five. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, "Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals?" No, and no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is, the, that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne and the, with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped Okay, what a picture we see here now within the throne room. As I say, we're going to be introduced to Jesus within this chapter there in heaven. The theme of this chapter, if you wanted to write a theme for this chapter, would be worthy as the lamb. That's going to be the point that's going to be being made by uh, everyone involved within this, including the one sitting on the throne. We're going to show that as well. But the one sitting on the throne, the, seven, the uh, four living creatures, the 24 elders, and all of the angels, and then all of creation is going to claim Jesus Christ to be worthy. And so we're going to be noting that when we, when we get into that. Now, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now that right hand, remember uh, the, right, the right hand is, the right is the, the, the hand of power, of strength. Remember where Jesus Christ sat down, at the right hand of God showing he has God's authority sitting there. Well, right here in the right hand of God the Father is a book. Now, does everyone have the word book there in verse 1? And I wonder if some translations might have the word scroll. You, oh, you do have scroll instead of book? Yes. What translation is that? My New American... New King James. New King James. Very good. That's a very good translation. The, word, the Greek word that's there is the word we get Bible from. It's biblion. Biblios is where we eat the form of biblios. And th that is where we get the word Bible. It just comes straight over into English from the Greek. But the word biblios literally means... Well, it means book. But in their day, well, they didn't have books like we do, like our Bibles. They had scrolls. And that's, you know, the, 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 the actual bound book wasn't created yet, wasn't made yet. And so biblion just means book, but in their day, that would have been a scroll. Uh, so, um, so notice what we're seeing here. And I, I've got pictures up there once again to show. It also does a good job of showing how the, how the scroll would have been sealed. It's going to have seven seals on it, this, this scroll is. And again, it's in the right hand of, of the one who sits on the throne, showing his, it has his authority. It's also going to show something else here in a moment. But uh, notice it's written inside and on the back. In other words, it's filled up. There's, there, there's, there seems to be no space whatsoever left over. This is going to be the full prophecy is, what, is what's going to be delivered. Basically, what's going to happen as we go through the, 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 the book of Revelation, starting in the first verse of chapter 6, and then ending with the first verse of chapter 8, is the breaking of the seven seals. And then, and then the seven seals are going to go into the seven trumpets, and then the seven trumpets are going to go into the seven vials or bowls, depending on which translation you have. Um, so the, right now we're going to be seeing the seven seals, and the breaking of each seal is going to show a portion of what's written in the scroll. Remember, this is all figurative language. We have Revelation written out for us in a book, okay? It's in our Bible. But, but this is going to be showing as a vision every time, every, um, additional portions of this vision every time the seal is broken. And again, don't forget the, what the word revelation means. It's a revealing. And these seven seals being opened that, that seventh seal, when I say the seventh seal is going to be, is going to be in, in chapter 8, verse 1, understand something. The rest of the book of Revelation from chapter 8, verse 1 to the end is the seventh seal. Okay, There's, it's going to have seven trumpets in it. It's going to have seven vials in it. It's going to have all that. It's going to have the battle of Armageddon. It's going to have what happens on, in judgment, the white throne judgment. It's going to have all that stuff in it. But all the rest of the Bible, of, of the book of Revelation, is the breaking of those seals and the revealing of the visions that come with it. Okay? Um, okay, I said all that. Uh, and I saw a strong angel. Now, notice the word that's used there for an angel. To me, all angels would be pretty strong. Okay? All right? Well, this, he's making a point of saying this is a strong angel. 
And they, that strong angel is going to say, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And then when it goes on to say, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was found worthy, that includes the strong angel. Okay. Now, obviously, the father would be worthy to open up the seals, but he's the one who wrote it out. He's the one who's giving the scroll. And so the question is, who is worthy to open up the book that the father has sealed, that God has sealed? But the strong angel is not. We're going to find out why he's not, or actually, we're going to find out why Jesus is, because Jesus obviously is going to be the one who opens up the, who's going to open up the scroll. So we're going to find out why Jesus is. That word worthy, it's the same word that's used in 1 Timothy 5.18. In this context here, it means qualified or good enough to open it. The rest of the chapter is going to deal with how God the Father, all of creation, is going to admit that the Lamb meets the qualifications to open up the seals, to open up the, yeah, to break the seals, open the scroll. Uh, no one in heaven or on earth or under earth. This is all of creation. All right. Remember, God is the only one, the only being that's not a created being. That would, that would include God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Everything else is creation. It, it was, was God in the beginning created it. Um, so... Uh, uh, so, so no one was able to open it or even to look into it. We already understand that the seals were there just to, to keep anyone from opening it who was not worthy. All right. So you could not even look into it. This phrase shows that it was sealed in such a way that without the breaking, one could not get the message. Okay. Um, in our day and time, you got a letter that you want to know what's set inside, you hold it up to a light, okay? Well, you are even going to hold it up to a light and see what's inside of it, see what's being read. Okay, v verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly uh, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Now, John is talking about, you know, remember, he's the one writing the vision. So when, whenever you see that word, I... This is John speaking about himself. He begins to weep greatly. Why would he weep if the seal could not be opened? Think about what John's responsibility is, according to God here in Revelation. Why would he be weeping? He wanted to know what was going to happen. He wanted to know what was going to happen. And what else, Sherry? He wouldn't know what to write. Yeah, he wouldn't know what to write. Exactly. Like Bob's saying, he's, he's interested in, what, in what's getting ready to happen, and he's been given the responsibility to write it down. So John's job is now over if that, if that scroll does not open up. So, yeah, between those two things, his own curiosity and his own responsibility to write it down, he won't be able to do it. All right. Um, Albert, there's one thing about the, the weeping uh, here. <clears throat> it, it was more than just sobbing. It was, it was a, a, deep, a deep wailing such as Jesus used in Luke 19.41 when he looking over overlooking the whole city and he began to weep because of their uh, unrighteousness yeah yeah the uh, the Jewish culture really knows how to weep <laughs> okay if if, uh, if you've ever seen whether you're talking about a movie or if you've ever been to a, a Jewish funeral the, the wailing that's done is is very is very they they know they have emotions like like crazy. There's, there's people even to this day that that is their profession. And when yeah. someone dies, you hire wailers. Right. You have to hire people that are going to cry. In the Jewish culture. That's their job. Yeah. In the Jewish even, culture. And maybe even just a good regional Middle East right. thing too. Maybe yeah. Just be Might be. Israel. I don't know about it. No, for sure in Israel. Yeah. Like that yeah. You hire in professional people to come and cry and mourn and weep. Right. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. They know how to, they know how to weep. And this is genuine. I'm not trying to say that John is not being genuine. He's, he's genuinely upset because he cannot get it open because, because no one is able to open it. But one of the elders says to him, stop weeping. Okay. Because there is someone who is worthy. The land, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of this. I'm going to be mentioning some verses, but well, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, this one I'm just going to mention. That's right. In Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 and 10, when when uh, Jacob is blessing his sons, he blesses Judah. 
and calls Judah a lion's whelp, or some translations, lion's cub. You are a lion's cub. And he says a couple of other things about him. Look at this. Jesus is called the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that Judah was, Judah was called a lion's cub. He was the very beginning of that tribe. Jesus Christ was the culmination of what Judah was going towards, the bringing about of the Messiah. So Jesus is called the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. He's the fulfillment, the completion of the promise that is given in Genesis 49.10 to, uh, to, uh, to Judah from his father Jacob. Uh, the root of David. Now, this is another interesting phrase that's used for Jesus Christ. In fact, it, the phrase is completed. Hold your hand right here and go with me to, to uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. And look what Jesus calls himself. He makes a point of using the phrase root, but also look at what he says. Let me read verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now, we know how Jesus Christ is a descendant of David. He's a fulfillment of the promise that God gave David that there would be one who would sit on his throne forever. Okay, so Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the descendant of David. How is Jesus the root of David? Yeah, Jesus is God. Jesus, God, God created Adam in the beginning. In fact, Luke's account gives, gives Jesus' genealogy, starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. And then uses that word, the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of. Well, Adam is the son of God, mentions there in Luke. God created him. God is the one who brought Adam into existence by creation. So, so Jesus is God. God became flesh and dwelt among us as in he was a descendant of David, Jesus. He became the Messiah. And so Jesus is the descendant of David and Jesus is the root of David. Jesus is where David came from and Jesus came from David. And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Well, here he mentions that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In other words, that's showing that same idea. He came from Judah and he created David. He, he was before David and also Judah. Okay, so, so it's an interesting, interesting little picture being given there by calling him the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of Judah. The same thing we see in Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. He was picturing both his uh, physical uh, beginning and also the deity. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so he says, he says, do not weep, stop weeping for the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome. Now look at that phrase has overcome. So as to open the book with its seven seals. Now in chapter three, verse 21, we see Jesus himself said that he was the one who overcame. Um, we also see that after overcoming he sat down at the father uh, by, at, at the right hand of the father on his throne in Acts chapter 2, 34 through 36. He fulfilled his mission coming to the earth, dying on the cross, raising from the dead. He fulfilled everything he was sent to do. And so see, so what Jesus overcame is linked to everything uh, he did in his mission on earth. So look at that phrase, so as to. Let me read that part of the verse again. Has overcome so as to open the book with its seals. That phrase, so as to, makes it clear that Jesus had to complete his mission or the revealing of what God was going to do following here in the book of Revelation could not come about. We oftentimes think about Jesus coming to earth to die on the cross for our sins. He did. 
but he also came to earth. We saw, we've seen other things it says he came to earth to do, to seek and save that which is lost. He came, he came for various reasons. Well, another reason he came was so he would be worthy to be able to reveal what's to come. So as to, okay. The Greek word for this is victory. What's that? Uh, he, he, I say the Greek word for this is victory, that he was victorious. And that's, that's what Hebrews 4.14 points out, the great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Yeah. Fulfilling, fulfilling the mission he was given. Very good. Now, verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain. Now notice, if you remember the picture correctly of, of, of the father's throne, God's throne, then there are four living creatures around the throne. There is a sea of glass or, you know, surrounding or in front of the throne. And then the, the 24 elders are outside. Remember, we, we gave the idea that that showed a separation between the elders, which would represent the, the old covenant and the new covenant, the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, uh, mankind, in other words, a separation between creation and God. Look where he says Jesus is located. I saw standing between the throne and the four living creatures. So in other words, he's right there close to God. He's within that separation between the two. Rather, I, rather interesting, Jesus is considered to be a mediator a mediator between God and man, God's word says. So that's one of the things we see with this picture, or we can, we can definitely note from this picture. Um, notice that word, and I saw between there. He saw the lamb. Where was the lamb before this point? We haven't seen him yet. So obviously the lamb shows up suddenly as an answer to the question, who's going to open up the, the scroll? Um, he had been missing from the vision to this point. Um, talked about that. A lamb standing. Now, interesting to note here as well, this is the last picture we have of Jesus Christ. Go to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 7, verse 56. Acts 7, verse 56. Remember what we quoted a few moments ago. We're not going to go there. But in Acts chapter 2, it says that Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of God. Well, look at what we see in Acts chapter 7, verse 56. This is Stephen. He's being stoned to death. And, he, and uh, let me start with verse 54. Now, when they heard this, they, the people Stephen was talking to, were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, I heard an interesting um, point about this. In Acts chapter 2, he sat down at the right hand of God. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is getting ready to die, just like Jesus died. Uh, for, for the faith, I mean, for, for doing right, for teaching the truth, Jesus Christ was killed. Well, it, I think it's interesting. Someone pointed out whether this is actually true or not. It's almost like Jesus is standing up, getting ready to greet Stephen when he dies. Um, well, now we see Jesus uh, represented as a lamb standing there. Okay. The lamb is, per, as a lamb, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that is willing, that is required to die once for all mankind. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist calls Jesus the, the lamb. I can't remember the quote. Behold, the lamb. The lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Takes away the sins of the world. Thank you. <laughs> Man, you get a brain block like that, drives me crazy. Yeah, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 12, also describes Jesus as that Lamb who, as a sacrifice, once for all mankind. Okay? <clears throat> what do you think about that way that Lamb looks? <clears throat> well, it, 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 yeah, it is creepy. Is it first or second? Corinthians, where we see that Jesus is our Passover, he would have been Passover lamb. 
I can't remember where it's at. Don't, you, you got me on that one. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, Google that. I, that's, that. That would be a good one to put there. Yeah, that's good. I, you got me on that one. You stumped me. I don't know where it's at. Uh, yeah, kind of creepy looking, isn't it? There's a reason for this. Remember the numerology. This is another reason why, and I love the fact that it's worded this way, and I wanted the picture up there so we could see it. This is something that would be a mutant, all right? And quite frankly, there's no reason to have seven eyes. There's no reason to have seven horns. It's the numerology that's important, okay? Like Amy said, that's just creepy, that's all it is. But there's a reason for the numbers. The number seven, by the way, did you get one of these, um, Amy? Did I give you a, uh, the numerology? Did I hand you one of those when you were here last time? Let's see where they're at. Ah, there it is. Numbers, numbers and revelation, what they, what they mean. It's a, it's a long study. I mean, it's not a long study. It's an important study. In their, in their, that portion of the world, numbers, numerology is an important thing. Kind of like us with the number 13. Number 13 in our culture is the unlucky number. But that's our culture, that's not theirs. You're not gonna see the unlucky number in the Eastern culture like that. But you will see other numbers that are important to them. And we've kind of taken a, little, a couple of men, 666 six, 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 for instance, where that comes from their culture. Or the number six is the number of failure or incomplete. Number seven is the number of completion. Yes, ma'am. First Corinthians five seven. First Corinthians five seven. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover. First Corinthians five seven. Let me write. Let me write that in real quick. Thank you. Um. Oh, that's right. All right. First Corinthians five seven. Thank you. For next time, I always like to get additional stuff. Okay. Now, no, notice now this, the reason for seven is it's a number of completion. Seven days in a week, for instance. Okay. We see it in the Bible. Um, well, seven, seven horns. These, this is one of those things that we, we uh, and you've, you've heard me say this when we first started this study, the Bible is the best place to go to find out what these visions, what these portions of the vision means. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 33, 17. Deuteronomy 33, 17. And we're going to note what, what the horn represents. Um, I can tell you what they're called. What? Deuteronomy, what? Deuteronomy 33, 17. I can tell you what they stand for, but it's better to have the Bible tell us what it stands for when, when we can. Look at verse 17. As the firstborn of his ox, majesty is his, and his horns are the horns of the wild ox. With them he will push the peoples all at once to the ends of the earth. And those are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and those are the thousands of Manasseh. OK, um, he's talking about the firstborn son of, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the tribe of, of Jacob. But notice notice what he, those horns are used for. Horns are the are the symbol of power, of strength. Let me show you another one. Go to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 18, verse 10. Second Chronicles 18, 10. All right. Second Chronicles 18.10 reads like this. Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah, made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Arme Armenians until they are consumed. So the horn was a sign of strength, of power. All right. So when it says that this lamb had seven horns, how about the phrase, um, all powerful, you know, representation of God. God is all powerful. And how about seven eyes? Now with that idea about horns, what would seven eyes show? All seeing. All seeing. 
And we talked about the seven, and he, in fact, he goes on to say about the seven eyes, the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the, the seven eyes gives the idea of all seeing and that connection with the seven spirits of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the Holy Spirit's called the, the, uh, the Spirit of Christ. Okay, so, so that idea of that connection with the Holy Spirit, it shows the Lamb's divinity. His all, his all powerfulness, his all seeing, his connection with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus says, I will send the Holy Spirit and he'll teach you more what you're not prepared to, to hear. Well, look at what it says again in this verse here in verse six, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Well, the Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus. So it makes sense that these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into the world are on the lamb because Jesus, John chapter 15, verse 26 and John chapter 16, verse seven, sent the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Right. This is showing this is showing uh, Albert, the omniscience and the omnipresence and the uh, omniscient or omnipresent and op omnipotence, what I'm trying to say, all three of these aspects yeah. related to God. Yeah. So when he yeah. says into all the earth, that's his omnipresence. Well, that's a good point. Very good. Sent into all the earth. He's, he's um, omnipresent, um, yeah, omnipotent, and, um, and all seen. Very good. Very good. All right. Now, verse 7. And he came and he took it out, the scroll, the book, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, remember what we said about that right hand. It's the, it's the hand of power. The lamb came and took it out of the father's hand. Now, this is God's way, the father's way of showing Jesus is worthy. If God the father didn't want Jesus to take it out of his hand, he wasn't going to take it out of his hand. And so Jesus came and took the scroll out. He took it, um, uh, did not overpower God. God gave it to him. God, the father gave it to him. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, that, that seems to be what's foreseen in that verse. Verse eight. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp, golden bowls of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. Now, the four living creatures, we talked about that. These, these are the seraphim and the 24 elders, both sides, both covenants, the, the old covenant and the new covenant, they all admit that Jesus Christ is worthy. Now, notice when they fell down, when it says, when he took the book, see, they, they recognized that God, God the Father authorizes Jesus to have it. They recognize that Jesus obviously is worthy to have it. So they fall down before the lamb. All right? They prostrate themselves before Jesus. This is a position of worship. In fact, that word worship is going to be used here by the end of the, by the, end of the book. But I believe they're worshiping right now. They, fall, they prostrate themselves before Jesus. Um, uh, whether, if there's a question about whether they're worshiping, look what happens next. Uh, they take, they have, each one of them has a harp and they begin to sing. Worthy are you to take the scroll and the break its seals for you were slaughtered. You were, you have purchased people for God with your blood goes on and describes several other reasons why they're singing praise to Jesus Christ. He is, he is worthy. Now the harp, this harp represents the praise given to God, Jesus the songs of praise that they are singing, the singing, however, is directed to the Lamb. So that's obviously, wor obviously worship. The golden bowls of incense. Where do we see the golden, where do we see bowls of incense in the Old Testament? The temple. The temple. Um, or before the temple was built, the tabernacle. But it's in the, it's in the holy place. But yeah, the tabernacle slash temple that was what stood before uh, on the altar before the veil and on the other side of the veil was the was the mercy seat where god resided 
Now notice the implication being given. This is another one of those favorite things of Julie's. It's a shadow, the old covenant, the example, the, the type and anti-type. In the Old Testament, it was a bowl with incense in it that the smoke rose up through the veil going to, going to the Father, going to where the Father was, going to where God was. Well, notice what they represent. The, the golden bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. Who are the saints? Christians. Yeah, we are. And by the way, under the old covenant, God's people under the old covenant, the Jews were the saints. Um, and remember what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross and the veil was ripped from top to bottom? And many of the saints came up out of the tombs. All right. So those saints, what he's talking about there are people who lived under the old covenant. They were, they were, they were God's chosen people. Not all of them, but many of them came up out of their tombs and walked about. They weren't, they weren't zombies. They were resurrected. Um, okay. For however long until they died again, I guess. Um, so now, these are the prayers of the saints being directed at Jesus. Jesus is God. All right. So they're singing to God, praise. They're praying towards God, prayer or delivering prayer towards God. Nothing wrong with Jesus receiving prayer. Nothing wrong with Jesus receiving praise. Okay. So that's what we see. That's what we see with these two, because Jesus is God and only God can receive prayer. Only God can receive worship praise like that. Albert. Yes. There, there's some symbolism here too that I think we can parallel with Christians today. The uh, the symbolism of the incense and the harps indicates that they were ready to worship. We need to prepare our minds to be ready for worship. These were ready whenever they began. Yeah, yeah, they were. But they and and there was reason for it, obviously, because Jesus Christ is worthy. He was able to take the scroll. Okay. Verse nine. And they sang a new song saying, worthy art thou. Now the new song, this is reminiscent to what we see in Psalm 98 verses one through nine. There, the song is directed towards Jehovah, a new song being sang towards God. Of course, Jesus Christ is God. So this would include Jesus Christ. Um, worthy art thou. Here we see, notice who's singing the four living creatures and the 24 elders. So here we see the seraphim and the 24 elders representing both sides of the covenant, repeating what, G, what the father has already implied by allowing Jesus to take the scroll. He's worthy. Notice the reason he's worthy. Worthy art thou to take the book and its break its seals for. Now there's several things he says here. First, he was slain. This speaks of Christ's sacrifice. And it speaks of it, by the way, in the past tense. Jesus was slain, but has arisen and now lives eternally. All right. He was sacrificed once for all. Um, didst purchase for God with thy blood. Notice who he purchased. And then we're going to talk about that purchasing in a moment. He purchased with his blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Peter says, you are not purchased with, with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb, redeemed. I'm sorry, the word redeemed is there. Same idea. You, you are redeemed or ransomed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In Acts 20, 28, Paul makes it clear Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. So when he's talking about men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, he's talking about the church coming out of each one of those things. Um, and thou hast made them. Now remember, the them are the people he purchased. So that's the church. Thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God. Notice the tense here. It has been done. Now, this is another one of those places where we see the, that it's not a future kingdom. It is a kingdom that is already in existence. 
the church came into existence in Acts chapter 2 on the, on the day of Pentecost. Jesus even made it clear that there are some of you who are standing here today who will not taste death. Do you see the kingdom come with power? <clears throat> so it came in the first century. John uses the past tense. Thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests of, to our God. Now we're part of the kingdom as well. We also have been made priests and kings. I'm sorry, priests and a kingdom. Um, the old King James, by the way, says kings there. And that's a bad translation. The Greek word that's here is the word for kingdom, not kings. And so, uh, but it's past tense. The kingdom is already in existence. And we'll say more about that when we see the thousand year reign or the thousand, yeah, the kingdom thousand year reign. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. Priests, we know that Christians are the priesthood. Now, this flies in the face of a lot of religions today that have clergy or priesthoods that are different than everyday Christians. All Christians are priests and priestesses. Okay. And so there is no clergy. Um, unless you want to say all Christians are clergy, and there are no laymen, but however you want to say that. But the Christians are priests, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9. Okay, And we're supposed to make sacrifice to God, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We sacrifice to God our will. We sacrifice to God. Uh, we are living sacrifices to God. All right? And only a priest can make a sacrifice. That's what, that's what Christians are supposed to do. They will reign upon the earth. Now, here's a question. How do Christians reign? Well, there are several ways, actually. Uh, part, uh, first of all, we're, we're part of the kingdom, and we know that Christ is, uh, is the kingdom, uh, is the prince or the king of the kingdom. And okay. we're part of that, and uh, so we have God the Father, and so we're part of the royal family, and Christ presently reigning, we are in Christ, so we share in his reign, and we've been saved, no longer uh, no longer ruled by the power of, of sin, but so we're, we're reigning in several different ways okay. today as Christians. I, I agree. Look at Romans 5, 17, basically says what, what Bob just said. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. And, and look how this fits into what, what Bob just pointed out. Romans 5, 17. For it is by the transgression of one death, it is by the transgression of one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, that's Christians, uh, people under God, God's people uh, receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, like Bob just said, Jesus Christ reigns through us, but we are a part of that. We, we, we are a part of it in that regard. All right. So we're see, we see that in Romans five seventeen, and then verse 11 And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands. Now, a couple things about this. Many angels. This is the third group that's going to witness Jesus as being worthy. Here's a good place to see a distinction, by the way. They are noted as being angels, different from the living creatures. The living creatures are seraphim. These are angels, not the same thing. Many people want to call, say, give the idea that seraphim and angels and cherubim, they're all angels. No, they're not. These are angels, messengers of God. Okay. Around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, just as Jesus had not been seen at the beginning of this vision, these angels hadn't been seen. But now they are suddenly, they suddenly appear in John's sight. Notice that these seem to be filling the space in and around the whole. Is it messing up? 
Oh, okay. I know. I remembered I left that computer on in there, so hopefully it won't mess things up. Um, just as Jesus had not been seen at first, now these angels suddenly appear. And notice that they seem to be filling the space in and around the whole vision. They're everywhere. Well, they would be. Look how many there are. Myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. The word myriad merely means an innumerable number. Way too many to count, I guess. A thousand thousand is a million. So thousands of thousands are just multi-million. Don't forget what, what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 1, at the very last verse of Hebrews 1. Angels are sent to serve those who receive redemption, to serve Christians. So, uh, you know, you need a lot of angels to be able to do that, I guess. But there's a lot of angels. So plainly, John is trying to give the idea there's a lot of angels that are there. Okay. Uh, they well, are created the number, beings. God created, obviously, a lot of them. We have the number 10 in there, which signifies completeness. So possibility that every angel in heaven was present. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they were all saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, this is another one of those places where we have some verses to look at. Um, they were saying in a loud voice, they're making a proclamation. This is without shame what they're getting ready to say. This is not a voice that is uncertain. And notice it is not voices, and these are all, vo it is not voices. It says they shout in one loud voice. They're all in agreement on what they're getting ready to say. The lamb is worthy. Um, same topic we've been seeing from the Father, from the seraphim, from both sides of the covenants. Now the angels are saying the same thing. He is worthy. He's worthy to receive. These are the things that Jesus is said to receive that are not merit, that are not unmerited. He is worthy. He merits these things. Power. Christ is the power of God. I'm not going to go to these verses. I'm going to give them to you, though. 1 Corinthians 1.24. Jesus Christ is the power of God. Riches. Christ is rich because he is God. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And in Christ are unfathomable riches. Ephesians 3, 8. Wisdom. Of course, Christ is wise. He, Christ is the wisdom of God. He's all-knowing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. And wisdom is found in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Uh, to receive might, it is, it is in Christ where our strength is found. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. And Christ is the strong man that is able to overcome Satan. In Luke chapter 11, verse 22. Honor. Because of his obedience and the death, Jesus has received honor from God. Hebrews 2.9, and I especially like Philippians 2.11, where his name is lifted above all other names because he was obedient to God. Glory. Because Jesus is God, he has the glory of God. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he was the glory of, you know, the, glory of the Father. Uh, blessing. Jesus is worthy of blessings from the Father and from man. Mark chapter 11, 9 through 10, and Romans chapter 15, verse 29. So these are all things that Jesus Christ is worthy of. And again, showing why he's worthy to open up the scroll. None of these things apply to the angels. None of these things apply to the strong angel who asked the question. None of these things uh, apply to the living creatures. So Jesus, and none of these things applies to anything else in creation, which, by the way, we're getting ready to see the rest of creation. Albert, we notice there are seven of these also indicating completeness, and it's another proof of Jesus' deity. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, this is the number seven. Good point, Bob. There's seven different things that he is worthy, that shows his worthiness. And again, shows, shows the completeness of it. Very good, Bob. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Now, in 13 and 14, hey, we're going to make it through the chapter. Good deal. In 13 and 14, we read this. And every created thing which is in heaven 
and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying. Okay, so let's stop right and we'll see what they say. Um, every created thing. This is the fourth group in this chapter, in this, this particular thing, that witnesses Christ's worthiness. All of creation recognizes it. There is nothing left. Christ's worthiness is perfectly acclaimed now. Saying, now remember, this is a vision. When did everyone in the universe say these words? <laughs> okay. This is merely showing in the vision that all creation knows it. Okay. Symbology that is given, that's, that's, is given to make the point that every creature and even God recognizes Jesus' worthiness. One day, all knees are going to bow to Jesus Christ. And, I, and I, I mentioned this when we talked about this in one of our other classes or sermons or whatever. I don't think they're going to be made to go to the knee. I think when you're in the presence of God, you drop to your knees. That's all, that's all there is to it. And, I, and on that day, Jesus Christ is going to be recognized by atheists, by, by people of false religions, everyone, Satan even, dropping down and recognizing Jesus Christ is worthy. All creation recognizes it. There's not going to be any being forced to do it. Okay. You're going to recognize it and you're going to understand it. Um, uh, da, da, da. Uh, be blessing and honor and glory, dominion forever and ever. Now, the only word in that in verse 13 that we didn't see above is the word dominion. The only um, the King James and the NIV says power. But this is a different word from the word power we see in verse 12. This word signifies dominion. Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ is Lord of Lord, King of Kings. He has all dominion. And here we see all creation recognizing that authority. You know, in uh, Acts chapter 4, I think it is. Yeah, 4. The Sanhedrin asked Peter and John, by what power did you do this thing? And they said that by the name of Jesus Christ, there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which people are saved. We did it by his power. And then forever and ever, well, it means what it says. It, all, it belongs to Jesus, and it will always belong to Jesus. Albert, I think there's something significant here, too, in that the the is used as uh, indicating that the one on the throne and the Lamb are the ones who are to be uh, honored and blessed and worshiped and praised. They received that. No other mankind was this ever attributed to. Yeah. We see that at the end of Revelation 2 when John tries to worship the angel that showed him the vision. And the angel says, do not do that. Worship God. That's right. In fact, look at verse 14 on that idea. Mm -hmm. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped that word. Amen. The seraphim agree with this statement that's been made by creation here in verses 12 and 13. They basically say that's the truth. Amen. And here we see the word worship being used. So earlier we noted it with the praise and the prayer that was directed to Jesus Christ. But the, the vision John wrote it down. They were worshiping. And it's correct. Jesus Christ is God. There is nothing wrong with worshiping God. Jesus Christ is God. He should be worshiped. And again, I want to reiterate that those 24 men represent both sides of the covenant, both covenants, both sides of the cross. All of God's Bible, his word, all of the truth Everything recognizes Jesus as being worthy. Any comments on chapter five? Something, something significant about if John were expecting someone of great power, how do you think maybe he felt about seeing a lamb that supposedly had been, had been slain standing rather than laying down as having been slain? But the point is, of course, that Jesus, though he was slain, 
rose again. Amen. And, if you, and if you think of uh, maybe someone uh, who leading in in a, a battle against wickedness, you would think maybe uh, John would have thought maybe a lion or something of great power. But here God has chosen the lamb, the, the meekest of all animals to do that. Amen. Amen. Well, that's the, it, it was it was in that way that he won the battle by sacrificing himself. Amen. Any other comments? We did good. See, all well, one chapter again next week. Uh, I'm excited. In fact, I, I was thinking that we were getting into the four horses of the apocalypse this week, and I was wrong. Next week, we're going to look at the four horses of the apocalypse, and that's going to be. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about, especially that first horseman. And I'll be interested in showing, uh, seeing exactly who that first horseman represents or what the it represents. Color is, the color of the horse is significant, too. It, yeah, it's the color that's significant. You're absolutely right of all four. Okay. Um, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Oh, Bob, what, yes. uh, has your, has, uh, what day did you say your surgery was set for? 21st of uh, January. That's your knee surgery? Yes. 21st of January. And Chris is having his surgery next week on Monday? Yes. Uh, That's yeah. correct. Okay. All right. Remember both of them in your prayers are going to be having their surgeries. And I'm glad that Chris is going to be able to have his. His had to be postponed. Okay. Bob's has moved up. <laughs> We're ahead of the game. <laughs> That's right. Well, Bob, you want to lead us in prayer, please, and we'll close? Sure will. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we have your word and, and that we can open it and study freely and learn what you would have us to know from your word that would help us to be more understanding, better servants, better Christians, better all the way around as those who have been following Christ. We are thankful to you that we have this blessed opportunity and are thankful for Brother Albert and his willingness to direct our minds Help us to always keep our minds open as we open our Bibles, that we might truly learn those things which we need to know and be willing to change our lives in order to be what you would have us be. Forgive us of our sins, Father. We ask in Jesus' name to be your will. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much.